folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Another movie review on Christmas Day. Because I just reviewed the original 1947 perennial holiday classic to join for this holiday season. So why not review the 1994 remake of the same title, Miracle on 34th Street, that came out on November 18 of that year. This time... It's produced and co-written, or at this rate, wrote it, but to join in with George Seaton's original screenplay from the 1947 classic. But I guess he probably had worked on this uh, before his death in 1979, or they had to come to rotation. They weren't so sure how this was going to turn out. I don't know. Or maybe they went far in between. So, yes, Huge had stepped in to actually uh, rewrite the story while remaining half of, of the original story intact, for sure. And this time they got Richard Attenborough to portray the role of Chris Kringle the way that Edmund Gwynn had played, you know, claiming that he's the real Santa Claus in New York City. Uh, he's also joined with uh, Elizabeth Perkins as the event director of the, the department store. Instead of being Macy's, it's Coles, which is fictionalized because uh, Macy's, Macy's wanted to uh, keep the name as intended for the original film, so they don't want to get involved in this one for sure. Because they felt, you know, it just wasn't right. So that's why they were going to go for something generic, in a way. So that's why it became the replacement. And because Gimbals went out of business in 1987, uh, they eventually came with a different uh, department store called Shoppers Express. So this is sort of like, let's go for this competition between... One department store that's so successful, that's been around for decades, to the other, which is like brand new or so. Or it's probably been around for, who knows. Yeah, that sort of thing. Like, like we're going for the heroes to the villains here. situation here. <laughs> okay. But anyway, um, Elizabeth Perkins plays Dory Walker take on Doris that Maureen O'Hara played. Uh, Dylan McDermott um, plays the lawyer. Um, this time it's not Fred, it's Brian Bedford. And he's the local neighbor, of course. And we also got Mara Wilson as Susan Walker. Six years old and Still sweet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, plus we got uh, James Ramar and Jane Leaves, uh, both of which are the minions, yeah, the executives uh, of the Shoppers Express, which the villain, of course, is Victor Landsberg in an uncredited role by Josh Acklin. You may remember him from uh, Lethal Weapon 2, and he was Huts. In the Mighty Ducks movies, uh, the first and, and the last one for the trilogy. So yes, you'll always recognize that guy. Yeah. And I also got J.T. Walsh as the, the prosecutor lawyer at Collins. And I I know he's no longer with us too, but still, yeah, the one who was um, who was eventually. Um, and he associated for Victor Landsberg. And he even got Robert Prosky, uh, Robert Prosky as, as the Honorable Judge Henry Harper. <laughs> yeah. And of course, the, the, the entire um, store uh, founder of Kohl's is, is of course, C.F. Cole by William... Uh, Wyndham, yeah, 
It was from um, the TV show uh, Murder, She Wrote with Angela Lansbury. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, so what they did here was, yes, yeah, some of the stuff is intact. All of the most familiar moments that you'll never forget, of course. I mean, the fact that uh, Susan is a non-believer, but... She begins to touch uh, Chris's beard to see how real it is, how long the riskers are, and um, and of course the the fact that he replaced uh, the intoxicated uh, Santa um, because they don't want to become an embarrassment of of the rest of the children and everyone around. At the parade, and um, several others here. Of course, even the ending, you know, with the with the the beautiful dream home, so on and so forth. <laughs> but they added some large portions of the story just to make it more serious. They added a lot of stuff that the original film didn't have, and it kind of did a little bit of changes. Like, they didn't have the mail letters instead. They got um, the reindeer. And the dollar bill. Well, I guess just to go for something religious uh, for that point. I, I guess so. They want to make the, the remake even better. But still want to pay some respect to the original 1947 classic, which that's exactly what they were trying to do. Because usually, that's the hard thing about doing a remake of, of the original is that there's always going to be a lot of changes. And sometimes um, it could either be an insult to them or maybe not. Maybe they're trying to keep the spirit alive for sure for, for this generation or any other. Just as long as, you know, things go in several ways. I mean, it, of course, it's going to be as modern from the time period, but they're going to try to to make sure it doesn't insult everyone's intelligence, even though it is pretty unnecessary to do so. But for me, I kind of went in with some almost mixed results when I first saw this as a kid, because um, I saw this movie... When um, when we were celebrating a, a Christmas party um, at elementary school, yeah, I was still in elementary school before I hit middle school. Um, yeah, because it came out on home video in 1995, and I and they rented it, and I watched the whole movie, and it was exactly what I expected. Like there was going to be some slapstick in there. That's home. That's John Hughes' uh, signature here. Because, after all, he did the Home Alone movies, so that explains it. I mean, then again, he does tend to put slapstick in, in other films before it. <laughs> and even after. And then he's probably going to put something you know, more dark. and Even though it may be lighter than a fetter, but it'll still be you know, PG rated. And maybe there might be... A little bit of foul language but not too foul so that's what I'm afraid of however uh, when I saw the movie I was very delightful to see how it turned out because I love the actors that they chose and this is perfect for it I mean I, I always knew who they were and it's always great that they got to portray it exactly as they should be so as long as they don't, you know, turn it down for sure. And it's great that they didn't have a bad performance, though. They, it could have been worse, a lot worse. But then there might be something that's just unnecessary, and, and they just didn't need to fit that for its runtime. Yeah, because it's only 114 minutes. I mean, you can cut that out, and you could still have a great movie. But I know maybe they just wanted to add a few more changes to to settle for it. Maybe for 
something more dramatic and more strong. I mean, it could still be a feel-good movie, but sometimes it could be really hard and cold. But, I know. That happens. Um, now, the movie came out. Um, it did earn its shares, um, despite the fact that it opened at number 8 uh, at the box office. I mean, it wasn't exactly... Almost, not exactly, almost as huge. Well, sort of huge, from it from the time period though, because it actually uh, grossed uh, worldwide for like over four forty six um, million, like over forty six million at the most. Which uh, they actually uh, finished it off um, when it first opened at two over two million but it but it started to grow stuff for 17 so it did okay um, but it's not exactly as strong as when the Santa Claus came out uh, that same year I mean November was a big weekend there were gonna be a lot of family films coming up during that season and then later in December too um, I know because films like the page master came out and that was the Macaulay Kogan movie, animated feature with live action. And that didn't do well. And then I know Richie Rich came out the following month, and that didn't do well either. Uh, but then, I mean, other films were coming out too. There was a big competition. I mean, while even for the fall leftovers, because of the Academy Awards um, nominations and as well as Golden Globes that was coming around, yeah, because you know movies like Pulp Fiction, Forrest Gump, The Shawshank Redemption. I mean, despite of the film being a flop, but that's okay. It they did tend to have some of its uh, sharings when when they had a re-release later on. I mean, they they had to struggle really hard too, and for the whole audience. And there was a lot of movies that were coming out at that time too. Uh, that were non-holiday films or or any kids films for that matter, family films. Uh, movies like uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein came out, then The Professional, which of course will be known as Leon the Professional, that was coming out, and and there were other films. Uh, even for the competition, I know they also had The Swan Princess. Yeah, that was an animated fairy tale, and I. There was also an um, interview with the vampire that came out, so the world to Whaleville, uh, Stargate came out too, so that could be the reason why you know, some movies uh, weren't either doing well or maybe they will do well, so maybe that was the case. So as long as they go out to see movies like this from that season, then they would, yeah. And it got mixed reviews when it came out. I mean, some people were not so sure. They thought it was unnecessary because they added all this other stuff in there. And the fact that the cast probably wouldn't even top the originals. That's for sure. I know, because it's hard. And, but nevertheless, they did lend it very well. Um, but surprisingly enough, Cisco and Eber gave it two thumbs up. I was surprised because, you know, they did enjoy the original film a lot that they figured, you know, they might give this one a pass despite of some of the issues here and there. And and I know Michael Medved from Sneak Previews eventually praised it as well. So some people actually gave it a pass. But then there are a few people that thought, hmm, doesn't work. But that's okay. Um, and people said it was curly depressing, too. But otherwise, um, it's a pretty rare remake. I mean, it won't be better than the original, for sure. At least they, they managed to pay some respects for 20th Century Fox, the film distributor. Which is now owned by Disney, of course. <laughs> Let's begin. Stars Richard Attenborough. 
Elizabeth Perkins, Dylan McDermott, JT Walsh, James Ramar, Mar Wilson, Robert Prosky, Simon Jones, Jane Leaves, you know, from Frazier, William Wyndham, Allison Jenny, yes, Allison Jenny, one of her earlier roles. I was kind of surprised how young she really was, especially with those eye bulging eyes, of, especially with her eye bulging that's popping out too in that that one scene that I saw I was surprised that was really her I mean she's older now but this was long before she went on to do films like Juno as well as um, any other film <laughs> she's done uh, Jack McGee Mary McCoy Mick Peter Garley uh, Jennifer Morrison, as you may know, went on to do the TV show Once Upon a Time. Yeah, where she played Emma Swan. Uh, Hawachi Sans, who later went on to become a cast member of Saturday Night Live. SNL. <laughs> Ron Beadle. Uh, Ron Beattie. And Josh Acklin. It's written by John Hughes, with screen credit by George Seaton, just using his original screenplay of the 1947 classic, which in turn was written by Valentine Davies. And it's directed by Les Mayfield, who of course went on to direct the movie Encino Man with Pauly Shore, Sean Astin, and Brendan Fraser in the role of the caveman. And then he later went on to direct uh, movies like... Uh, movies that he directed. Um, yeah, he went on to direct the, the movie Flubber. He had the remake uh, with Robert Williams. Uh, Blue Streak with, uh, with Martin Lawrence. And then... Went on to do films like American Outlaw with, uh, with Colin Farrell, uh, The Man with, uh, yeah, Lane Comedy, uh, or a Buddy Cop uh, movie. Sort of like a ripoff of 48 Hours with um, Samuel Jackson and Eugene Levy, and codenamed The Cleaner, that the last movie that he ever did uh, that had... Uh, Cedric the Entertainer, Lucy Liu, and Nicole Sheridan. Yeah, that one. Mm. Lame. But hey, at least <laughs> the two girls are hot enough for it. But just a kind of a lame uh, secret agent movie. The movie began set in New York City on Thanksgiving Day. The Coles Department Store Special Events Director Dory Walker, played by Elizabeth Perkins, had just fired the department store Santa Claus named Tony Falacci, who's played by Jack McGee, who just became intoxicated and totally drunk just before he was taking part in the Thanksgiving parade, for sure. But a miracle had appeared, and that turned out to be our jolly old man, Chris Kringle, played by Richard Attenborough, who just came in to complaint uh, with Dory until she ends up hiring him to take his place, for sure. So that way they won't have any problems. Because after all, uh, Tony eventually uh, exposed the children, scarring them for life when he shows his crack, and then his pants fell down, just as he was getting ready to go on the Santa sleigh, uh, filled with the rest of the, the reindeers. Yeah, even trying to use the whip. And then suddenly, the entire sleigh uh, fell apart just and ends up... You know, he actually fell all the way down, and then the sleigh actually crushed him. <laughs> so now, uh, they had to fix the entire Christmas bow for sure. So now, Chris can actually be able to go on and become our jolly old Saint Nick right in front of the entire crowd. 
of patrons and all the families around get around to watch the entire Thanksgiving parade because it's tradition. Yeah. <laughs> Um, despite of his apparent belief that he is indeed the real Santa Claus, for sure. Because at the beginning, though, um, while he was crossing the street, you know, wearing the top hats and the walking cane, um, that's where we saw Honorable Judge Henry Harper, played by Robert Prosky, joins with his son, telling them to ask him, thinking that he is Santa Claus, the real Santa. <laughs> And then he says, as he whispers on his ear, I am. And then he says, oh, nuts. I should have got him his autograph. <laughs> yeah, just before he finally enters the parade. So he became that successful enough to finally work and hi be hired by Dory as Santa Claus. Um, so that way he'll be able to sit on the chair uh, while all the rest of the kids go by to ask him while sitting on his lap about what they want for Christmas. So, so anyway, um, he lauded the children and parents to come visit him with his unusual possibility to direct shoppers to other department stores uh, all the way around New York City, including uh, their competitor, the rival um, store next to Coles uh, at 34th Street called Shoppers Express, and because unfortunately, for a successful marketing campaign for Coles, it became a sudden turnaround that they just only recently survived a hostile takeover bid by uh, the villain and the owner of the entire department store, Victor Landsberg, who's played by uh, Josh Acklin. Join in with his minions, uh, an executive, uh, Jack Duff, who's played by James Ramar, and Alberta Leonard, played by Jane Leaves. Yeah. Now, Dory just... Uh, got out of the shift um, because she just finished her job she just wanted to relax on Thanksgiving just ready to take a hot bath to get ready only to find out that her daughter Susan uh, played by Mara Wilson is just staying over um, next door to her neighbor who is indeed an attorney lawyer named Brian Bedford very handsome and all, played by Dylan McDermott. Yeah, I mean, she basically just filmed uh, just a, a video on, on the camcorder just to let her know. And once uh, Dory came, I mean, they were just having a Thanksgiving, just having fun and all. <laughs> yeah, just having some delicious turkey and all the other foods and all that's on the table. Yeah, perfect. Uh, anyway, so later on, um, just when Chris is already still uh, working at Kohl's, uh, of course we have um, Donald Shellhammer, the general manager of Kohl's, played by Simon Jones, who's, who eventually found out about the uh, particular successful marketing campaign that will be able to uh, go right off the roof for sure and they actually uh, bought in a scrapbook to put all these advertisements of any department stores so they'll be able to to search for all of of the toys that are from other department stores to be sent there and that way all the rest of the customers will become a loyal Kohl's uh, customer which um, that depends on the proprietor of Kohl's, uh, C.F. Cole, played by William Wyndham. And it, it worked. <laughs> it really does. So anyway, uh, when Brian um, 
brought in uh, Susan to uh, to meet Santa Claus, which at this rate Chris Kringle, as we know. Um, yeah, while well, he was very busy, you know, asking all the kids what they want for Christmas, and then because um, both uh, Dory and Susan are non-believers, because they thought Santa doesn't exist, it's a myth, because they have to use truthful and common sense right there, yeah, just like in the original. Well, anyway, she's trying to figure it out for sure, if he's just another fake, but he isn't, because, well, at least that's what he claimed, because he does have all the white whiskers all around his face, yep, his entire beard. Kind of short, though. <laughs> Not long like uh, what Edward uh, Wins was. Anyway, that's why she was showing some proof by pulling the, the chin as uh, Chris uh, reluctantly uh, shows her. <laughs> and she was surprised, too. Yeah, that scene. Uh, then afterwards... Um, just because she was taking her time, yeah, Dory just calls her out. Uh, next thing you know, um, she spotted uh, a deaf girl, and that's when Chris decided to to communicate with her using sign language, just like in the original film when they got the Dutch girl, and because she doesn't speak English, uh, Chris actually uh, knows uh, Dutch or many language to communicate with her so that was really nice I, and it really surprised uh, her mother yeah hey I like that change that they went in for so they had a conversation about about their beliefs or non-beliefs so they want to be truthful common sense and all uh, during that particular night, um, yes, they did have to invite um, Chris uh, to stay over because they couldn't find any babysitter to choose, so he would be the right choice to babysit uh, Susan. While both um, Brian and um, Dory decided to go on a date together. After all, I mean, she is her boyfriend. That's their neighbor, and hoping that you know, they'll take some time before they get to know each other even more. Well, anyway, of course, the, there was a moment, too, where um, they were playing the hand puppets. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretending where they show um, the reindeer huh, on the wall, <laughs> you know, through the light. Uh, anyway, because... Uh, Susan didn't uh, ask Chris what she wants. It turns out, because this was a secret, that she wanted to have a dream house that's somewhere in the suburbs of New York uh, that was on a, a magazine catalog uh, photo that she had hidden somewhere. And he thought this will be the promise uh, that Chris will ever get. And also, she wants to have a family, too. That includes a baby brother, if this works. But he'll see what he can do, for sure. So he does continue to go for his shifts. Um, yes, he also, even after um, he was done there, I mean, he does make contact with the reindeer at the Central Park Zoo. <laughs> yeah, it was Prancer and Cupid. <laughs> Just around. Or I was just going back home and all. With his top hat and rocking keen. Uh, therefore. It only got worse when. Jack eventually hires. Um, Tony to. Uh, while well, they went to. The local bar. Yeah, he was drinking beer and all. To actually. Make a commitment to. Go over there to Coles to actually make a mockery out of him you know egging him pushing his buttons so in order for him to get paid more 
and you know, maybe they'll hire him to be his Santa for sure if this happens so yeah so for that pay alone he'll be able to be able to kick him out or get into bigger trouble well it happened and this one depressing scene that got me angry um, well, before I get to that scene, uh, let's go back to another scene was when both Dory and Brian were having a nice date, um, go, running around the Times Square, you know, going out to eat, you know, just, you know, see some, probably just see a movie or something, or maybe skate uh, at the Central Park rink or something like that. I mean, any other kind. I mean, even if it's not shown in the movie. Until when the date ends, he eventually shows um, Dory a gift, and it, an early gift, and it turns out to be an engagement ring, thinking this will be the special gift um, for both of them to uh, become husband and wife. So it was supposed to, so it was going to be this one particular proposal hoping that she will marry him, but she felt like it was just too soon um, and felt like it just wasn't right after he just already got divorced by his last, by her last husband and, and just felt like it'll just be another disaster. Well, he eventually blew it, um, got rejected for sure. And at that rate, um, Chris just left, just ready to go back home. Um, while uh, Brian was all alone, uh, sitting in the park bench, uh, just feeling pretty depressed because she just said no. And well, maybe they'll think things through. They were, he was going to probably return um, the engagement ring, but at that rate, Maybe Chris will hail on to it or so. Maybe give it to someone or, I don't know, maybe he'll think about it. Okay, now we're going to go back to another depressing scene for sure. And this one's the one that got me angry. I mean, for the movie, of course. But don't worry because I'm going to praise this film for sure. Even though I won't top it. Anyway, by the time he just got out uh, from Coles, he just finished... Um, you know, being Santa, got his um, working shifts for sure. He got what he, he got done with, got paid for sure. All of a sudden, he got harassed by Tony, and then he was ready to, like, you think he was going to maybe pull out a gun or something like that, but then eventually, just right in front of um, uh, Alberta and Jack, although technically... Uh, earlier on, Jack and Alberta did took Chris um, on a ride on, on his limo just to take him to his place and all. Or maybe offered a deal for sure. Well, anyway, to make matters worse, because he already said, um, no deal. I'm not going to be playing Santa at, at a rival uh, Shoppers Express because I'm his colds already hired me to do so. Yeah, he rejected the offer. Anyway, he was ready to grab his cane and whack him. But at this point on, he didn't really whack him at all. Or it was going to, but he just... Tony just fell on the floor. But there was no marks on his forehead for sure. So this whole thing was a setup pretending like he got hit and he felt bad about that and he didn't mean it because he was attacking him right in front of everybody and Jack was was tricking him thinking that he did this and then he got arrested and was being sent to Bellevue Hospital mental institution so at that rate uh, Brian came over to get him out of there uh, you did meet the older Lee, 
uh, that's played by Hiracho Sans. Oh, oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, um, even during Cole's, um, you know, while he was shopping over there, uh, yeah, while he was there um, as Santa, uh, yeah, one of the customers, um, believe it or not, was indeed uh, the woman with the eye bulging. It was, of course, played by Allison Jenny. <laughs> He's one of the uh, customers, of course. <laughs> okay. I uh, just want to add that for, for that reason. I'm sorry, I'm just going over the place, too. So, now um, they're in trouble because they're about to destroy his image for sure. And they weren't, and they were going to plan on replacing him. But at this rate, they just didn't have their holiday spirit, so... Dory came to the rescue to fix this problem by having everyone in the entire New York City to believe in Santa. And that's why they have all these other ad campaigns around, including 7-Up, Billboard. Yeah, they were the sponsors for the film. And you saw, like, you know, other, um, well, they were having news reports on, on Chris that's already arrested. They show his mug shots around the Times Square screens and all this other stuff. But they're doing what they can to actually make this campaign more and stronger so everyone will believe uh, more than the non-believers around. Uh, meanwhile, Brian just came over to, to take uh, Chris out of there and he's going to defend him for sure, which leads to a courtroom trial. The People versus Chris Kringle <laughs> for his belief as the real Santa. So, of course, that's where we got Judge Henry Harper to join. And this is where they got the prosecutor lawyer Ed Collins, played by J.T. Walsh, who's not only the city prosecutor, but he's the associated of Victor Landsberg. So that means... Uh, He's going to be the one that's going to offend. The it's going to be able to offend the case uh, to convince that Santa is not real for sure. Well, that's what his son believes. That <laughs> that well, apparently he was joking around. He knows for sure that that is the real Santa right there because he asked him what he wants. Uh, for Christmas and he got something um, a long time ago yeah. just like in the original film <laughs> and then it kind of leads to other mockeries going around because instead of um, well the Santa letters uh, yeah all, all the mail letters and sacks like a bunch of sacks from, from the post office well there was uh, <laughs> a reindeer yeah from the Central Park Zoo that at this way, he was trying to, you know, put trying to uh, get him under his skin for Chris, like he's ready to to go nuts for sure. But he was trying harder not to, like he's almost about to make an outburst for sure at the courtroom. But luckily, um, in the next uh, trial, the luckily. Uh, Susan was there with Dory, so they were getting ready on Christmas Eve. That, and I'm glad because she was very strong. Uh, she was ready to uh, send the the uh, Christmas card that it actually contains a dollar bill because while Brian was there all alone, was about to ask uh, in secrecy to. Um, to uh, Henry about what's really going on in the world, you know, greed, power, and dollar bill that has the line, in God we trust. So, so instead of the letters that we get in this version, yes, uh, this is where, you know, Susan just came by, gives uh, Henry the uh, the Christmas card that comes with a dollar, and this is where he explains about 
how in the United States of America, Treasury uh, used the, the quote in God Retrust uh, to make their beliefs and amends uh, for, for God. So they know that this will be a miracle for them. So if this could happen, then by the United States and New York City, for sure, that it can also claim that if this could be the belief of, of God, then they can believe that Kris Kringle is the official real Santa Claus. So they won the trial and he and Chris is free. So now he's gonna get ready for for Christmas Eve to finally deliver all the gifts as he promised for the rest of the kids and the families around and hoping that uh, Susan will finally get her promise too uh, while they're celebrating for a Christmas party yeah so Christmas morning came and that's when well during after midnight because uh, it, it was Christmas already uh, there was a surprise that actually occurred where for both um, Brian and Dory they end up at church at night and the priests had came and they're getting ready for a proposal right there where because he got the the engagement ring so now it turns out that they're both gonna get married together and they did <laughs> just when Christmas morning arrives so now <laughs> There goes um, the dream house. So yes, finally Susan got her wish. They now live at a dream house that's for sale. All, uh, all signed and yeah, you know, I guess with the help of uh, <laughs> with um, Donald Shellhammer. That's yeah, they really approve. Uh, the place so it's theirs all from the help of Chris Kringle thank you yeah I would definitely say it's a great remake to the original um, even though yes there were issues with the story that just doesn't work but some of them do I would definitely say um, maybe they could have done some other changes that they didn't need to add like like we didn't maybe we didn't need another intoxicated Santa you know as a joke and maybe they didn't need to put some of the other dark stuff in the movie to make it more feel good or any of this unnecessary stuff too where you know we had to go I mean you'll still have the rivals of of department stores too but it, but we don't need to go for this hero and villain type of story here especially when we know that exactly at the end where the minions are probably gonna end up believing already while they're wearing those those uh, pin buttons that says I believe yeah and that's what they show in that scene um, towards the end and um, I mean, we never got to see Tony again, because this whole thing was a setup. Like, I was expecting maybe to see a, a courtroom scene where uh, they were gonna they were gonna show him for sure, and then that way they're gonna attack him. Like, I, I was hoping for that too, and then, but no, we never saw him again. It's unbelievable. Um, but uh, hey, there was a nice scene where. Where Susan actually attacks uh, uh, Ed Collins, uh, and I thought, "Wow, that was that was very strong right there." Because the way he was acting at the courtroom, I mean, the way the trial was going, I mean, it was this was like uh, this was like a baseball game. Only it's Christmas, <laughs> so it feels like that. Anyway, um, 
And, yeah, there were some flaws here and there that they could have improved. Uh, but I, I, I understand. They wanted to add some more to the story so it could be more fresh. Something that the original film didn't have and should have had uh, for its long running time. Because, you know, we are in a different era here. Or the fact that there could have been more serious tones um, as opposed to being a feel-good movie. Like, having to, the, of course, the scene with having the Chris being inside uh, Bellevue Hospital in his room, you know, looking straight into the window while it was raining, and he was looking all depressed, you know, took his glasses off. It was like amazing. Or the fact that he was almost trying to hit uh, Tony in that really dark scene because that, I mean, even though he was being threatened, it could have been worse. Or any of those other dark tones uh, or any adult humor here and there, like maybe some, or the scenes where they show them all drunk, had a beer and everything. That, that particular tone. Um, other than that, though, um, I thought the cast was great. Um, while they may not top uh, the original cast in the 1947 film, I thought Richard Attenborough did a great job portraying the Chris Kringle. I mean, I know I sort of picture him as the professor who's the grandfather of his two kids in Jurassic Park. So I sort of pictured him in a way, <laughs> but he really nailed this one for sure. And Elizabeth Perkins was she was very nice, but most of all, I, I thought Dylan McDermott's uh, performance uh, was very strong too. And I, I guess maybe the funny thing was though was that usually, you know, for a woman who works at a department store and she works so hard putting everything together, I mean, you're expecting for Elizabeth Perkins to be as strong as ever, which she did, because especially with that moment that she had, it was like she wants to fix everything here. But I think there could have been more to it. But I would definitely say um, that Daryl McDermott was uh, the real hero here because he really uh, not only defend uh, Chris to save Christmas and also to make everyone believe that he's Santa, but he's indeed the the one who can actually find a miracle. And that's what he's doing because he's the one who can believe. And that's what I love about that. And of course, Mara Wilson is cute um, as Susan. And in spite of being a non-believer, before she ends up becoming a believer, that's where she begins to figure out for sure if if it does happen. But I love the fact that, you know, she, she was up against uh, the prosecutor in that scene and also helping out the judge in that moment or even when she was together with uh, Chris in that scene. So it, it was wonderful. Um, J.T. Walsh is, well, yes, always playing jerks or, or any other uh, Josh Acklin as the villain of the entire, uh, despite it being uncredited, though, I mean, yes, they know they were, you know, he's the one who never believes, for sure, to know that Santa doesn't really exist at all, make believe, and the fact that he has his minions to join in, to back him up, to the ones who wanted to hire him, but refused the offer. All that. And and yes, I got my gingerbread. <laughs> Sorry. I'm a little hungry too. Um so it is pretty modern too because you know you do see some advertisements around. I mean you see what Times Square looked like um in nineteen ninety four. I mean yeah, you even spotted uh, the Tonight Show with Jay Leno <laughs> well, billboards on there too and Everyone was was all jumping for joy and for the entire crowd and, and the way New York really looked back in the 90s before 
Yeah, I know. I, I want to mention that trail, the tragedy. Oh, and it was also beautiful, too. I mean, showing the... Because just like how they shot Home Alone 2, they did show uh, the shot of, of the big Christmas tree at Rockefeller uh, Center. The Rockefeller Plaza, that is. Yeah, that, that's another scene that both uh, uh, Brian and Dory were actually uh, spotting, for sure. <laughs> that was cute. So, so um, again, great remake. I enjoyed it. I mean, it could have been worse, but I'm glad it wasn't. And it definitely pays respects, for sure. I mean, I, they knew what they were trying to do. So, I enjoyed it. So anyway, that's Miracle on 34th Street, the 1994 remake. And I give the movie four stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora. Have a wonderful Christmas. I'll see you later. Bye.